and by our Ho-Chunk hosts as the Deer Running Moon. Counting from the earliest days of colonialism in the Americas, indigenous activism's many manifestations range from protest oratory to physical demonstrations, often with lives on the line, to scholarly endeavors. Our panel represents the latter, and their work also includes community outreach as well as community inreach. Indigenous activism is quite global, and throughout the Americas, we witness state violence against activists, from the Mapuche land struggles in Chile to various pipeline protests in North America. Contemporary activist scholars and educators, as participants in decolonizing efforts, engage in what we call indigenizing the curriculum, while also assisting native tribal groups and communities in their journeys of sovereignty and self-determination and well-being. Our panel today of academic activists span the continent and provide a sampling of activist endeavors from late 19th century to today, all of which serve as nonviolent exemplars of indigenous activism. As far as the logistics go for the next 75 minutes, I will introduce all the speakers, providing a brief abstract of their talks up front. You'll find more information of our panelists' research interests and larger scholarly endeavors in the digital program for this, pro for this uh, diversity event. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes, followed by an open question and answer session. Questions via the chat may be directed to a specific professor or the group as a whole. Our diversity forum volunteer, Dana Goodman, will monitor the chat, sending questions along to the panel, which I will verbalize to the panel and audience after the presentations. Dana is the return to work coordinator for UW-Madison, particularly assisting our veterans as they readjust from military service into community life. In Native communities, veterans have always held a particular place of honor, and we are grateful to have Dana with us today. Our first speaker, Dr. Matt Villeneuve, is an assistant professor in history and American Indian studies. His heritage includes Turtle Mountain Chippewa descent. Matt's talk today is entitled, Laura Cornelius Kellogg's Lessons in Activism. Kellogg, Wisconsin Oneida teacher, writer, and activist was perhaps the most outspoken voice of a cohort of Native women teachers who found, very, found vocations teaching in federal Indian schools from 1890 to 1930. These teachers often used their positions to mitigate the effects of federal assimilationist policies to maintain the integrity of children's Native identities. Not always successful, however, Kellogg and these teachers embraced a vision of schooling that helped make classrooms compatible with modern Native ways of being. Second, we'll hear from Dr. Jen Rose Smith, Assistant Professor in Geography and American Indian Studies. Jen hails from the Dahunyu Alaska Native Tribe of the Copper River Delta region. Her paper is entitled Elizabeth Peratrovich, anti-discrimination organizing in the 1940s Alaska. President of the Alaska Native Sisterhood during the 1940s, Tlingit Elizabeth Peratrovich lobbied for an anti-discrimination bill in Alaska during a time of widespread segregation in Alaska, wherein whites only spaces disallowed entry to Alaska Natives. Her lobbying efforts helped pass an anti-discrimination bill through the Alaska Territorial Legislature in 1945, almost two decades before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed by Congress. Our third speaker moves us to the Midwest, Dr. Sasha Maria Suarez, Assistant Professor in History and American Indian Studies. Sasha identifies as a White Earth Ojibwe descendant. Sasha's paper is entitled, American Indian Women and the 1975 Opening of the Minneapolis American Indian Center. When the Minneapolis Indian Center opened in 1975, it did so in large part because of decades of work by American Indian women, 
through community organizing, program creation and implementation, and civic involvement. Indigenous women were able to work behind the scenes to push for an Indian center that would serve the growing urban community's needs to this day. And our final speaker today is Dr. Casey Keeler, Assistant Professor of Civil Society and Community Studies in the School of Human Ecology and in American Indian Studies. Casey is an enrolled member of the Tuolumne Miwok Tribal Community in California and descendant of the Citizen Band of Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma. In her paper, Tribal Housing, Activism, Land, and Property, Casey explores ways tribal nations resist and challenge narratives of American Indians as anti-capitalist. Instead, she centers them in land transactions, connecting the long history of American Indian dispossession to the innovative ways Native people use land as capital to resist co settler colonialism. Casey shares examples from the Red Lake Nation and Mill Lock Bond of Ojibwe, both tribal nations in Minnesota. And so now, without further ado, we will introduce uh, Matt Villeneuve. Matt, are you ready? Yeah, Susan, thank you so much for that very comprehensive introduction and sort of giving us a global view of the sweep of this panel today. Uh, Bojo and hello. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to my other panelists, Sasha and Casey and Jen, for being here. I'm super excited to sort of think together. Um, my research comes out of sort of the history of American Indian education and my particular focus is on boarding schools. So I'm really excited to sort of have a chance to talk with you all um, about one of my favorite activists, I think, who comes out of this moment, Laura Cornelius Kellogg. And so I want us to sort of go back in time uh, to 1912 in Columbus, Ohio. And it's there at a meeting of the Society of the American Indians in Columbus, Oneida activist, educator, and philosopher Laura Cornelius Kellogg delivered a talk entitled Some Facts and Figures on Indian Education. And in this talk, Kellogg harangued her audience about the quality, or rather lack thereof, um, of the federal government's curriculum in its Indian school service. And she lamented that the government's inexcusable underfunding of the system's programs for room and board, cultural chauvinism of non-indigenous educators, and the criminal neglect of student health. And so Kellogg's critique of the sort of shoddy conditions and the curriculum of government boarding schools was then followed with what I think is a surprising concession about teachers. She said, quote, I do not mean to pass over the superiority of some of those who are employed in the Indian service, she declared. One cannot help appreciating the noble service of some few earnest souls who are there through their sincere heart interest in the race, who are efficient enough to be acceptable anywhere else. We all know them and appreciate them, but they are sadly in the minority. Now at first, I think this rhetoric could be read as another attack on the non-native teachers of the Indian school service, right? Of the majority of whom were non-native. However, when, her, when Kellogg asserts that her audience knew these teachers, she herself knew better than most that indigenous people in her audience were themselves a part of the federal school system. And they circulated as activists, reformers, and experts in the wings of broader movements in American Indian education and American education sort of writ large. For these reasons, I think there's good reason to believe that Kellogg's praise of the noble service of a few earnest souls also included indigenous teachers in the federal Indian school service. Now, Lord Vinnie Cornelius was born in 1880 near Green Bay on the Oneida Reservation in Wisconsin, and she went on to a long career as a Native activist. She was herself the secretary of the Society of American Indians, the SAI. She lectured audiences, both Native and non-Native alike, sort of assertively about Native capacity for self-government. She wrote a book which imagined reservations as indigenous homelands as early as 1922. 
sort of thinking through socialist economies as a way forward, supported by small-scale collective industry. And she gave powerful testimony to the U.S. Congress. So she's remembered as a political and a social theorist, um, an activist speaker and writer, and an indefatigable organizer. But I think historians have actually underappreciated an important thread amongst this bundle of activism, right? And that is Kellogg's constant concern about schools. So I argue in my work that Kellogg's activism for improving federal schooling is exemplified in her 1912 talk. This is an exercise in a broader concern for self-determination in education. Kellogg herself was highly credentialed as a learner. She attended um, Grafton Hall in Wisconsin, Stanford University in California, uh, Barnard College, and yes, even the University of Wisconsin uh, in 1908. So during this academic career, she was trained as a teacher. And in 1902, she was hired as an instructor at the Sherman Indian Industrial School in Riverside, California. So this is one of these 27 industrial boarding schools, right, run by the government. And so she worked there from 1902 to 1905. And in the decades that followed, she wrote many articles and delivered many talks about Native education, including in her role as vice president of the SAI's education division from 1911 to 1913. Oh yeah, and that testimony to Congress, right? It was about the quality of Native schooling. And her master work, this book called Our Democracy in the American Indian, can be read as an early manifesto for self-determination in schools based on reservations. So often classified as a political or an economic tract, when properly contextualized within her lifetime concern for schooling in mind, that 1922 book offers a very expansive vision for self-determination in schooling for Native nations. In Our Democracy in the Indian, Kellogg makes a case for synthesizing education in democracy, which I argues rivals the likes of John. Oops, got a little glitch there. Bear with us. We have we lost you there for a second, Matt. To realize her project of reservation-based community schooling, it didn't work out for a variety of reasons, but. For these reasons and more, she merits greater consideration, not just as a theorist of anti-colonialism, but as an important philosopher and practitioner of education and democracy in the United States. Now, the Indian School Service consisted of hundreds of boarding schools across many reservations, and there were 26 to 27 Austro Reservation boarding schools that were built between 1879 and 1932. At its peak, this school system enrolled over 10,000 students annually, and over the course of nearly 40 years saw approximately a quarter of a million indigenous children pass through their dormitories, their workshops, their cafeterias, and their classrooms. Modeled in part from the Hampton Normal School in Virginia, many of these off-reservation Indian schools featured teacher training programs. In fact, in the 1890s, five of the system's earliest schools featured teacher training departments. And using these credentials, many graduates of these boarding schools found gainful employment as teachers in the Indian school service between 1890 and 1934. Whereas the government reported zero indigenous teachers on its payroll in 1888, scholars like Kathy Cahill have shown but there were at least 50 by 1905, including Kellogg. And so while exact figures remain sort of elusive, based off my ongoing research, I believe that there's well over 100 Native instructors teaching in off-reservation boarding schools by 1934. This cohort of Indigenous instructors included not only such notable figures, such as Angel Decora, Ho-Chunk, Zikala Shaw, Lakota, Ruth Muskrat Bronson, Cherokee, Ella Carey of Deloria, Lakota, and Elizabeth Bender Cloud, Anishinaabe, but also lesser remembered but equally important figures such as Polengease Koyoema, Hopi, Marguerite Lafleche, Omaha, Lucille Winnie, Haudenosaunee, and Esther Burnett Horn, Shoshone, among many, many others. And together, I think they formed a cohort of indigenous instructors 
who were an enduring presence in government boarding schools that afforded these indigenous women a surprising opportunity to exert their influence over a program of schooling for assimilation. Now, indigenous women became instructors for a variety of reasons. Many, such as Horn, for example, took the job because it offered a steady source of income, room and board, connection to the school's indigenous communities. Right? Some believed in the government's mission of assimilation, such as Polingayasi, who later struggled in her life with her decision to willfully depart from the Hopi frame of action, which she said. Others, such as Winnie, were inspired to become teachers because of their parents. Right? She remembers her father saying, the trite old saying that my father quoted to us many years ago is still true, she wrote in her memoir, in the Indian youth lies the hope of our people. Like so many other indigenous women in the early 20th century, working as a federal instructor was ultimately then a means to look after the welfare of indigenous youth as best they knew how. Now at a critical juncture between the government's prescribed curriculum and the indigenous students in their classrooms, these indigenous women found themselves in a unique position to pursue such a goal. Unlike matrons, teachers were less responsible for enforcing the boarding school's carceral discipline. And as a result, a number of these instructors were able to not only mitigate some of the traumatic effects of cultural erasure through schooling, but in fact harnessed schooling for indigenous ends working within the schools designed to do the opposite. Becoming a teacher was both a job uh, with a, a sort of a, a rung on a ladder to a white collar profession, yes, but it was also a means for many of these women to imagine themselves to con as continual caretakers of a generation of indigenous children. If, as Kathy Cahill has argued, indigenous employment in boarding schools, quote, helped foster a modern intra-tribal identity, right, it's my contention that it was native teachers most of whom were women, which were best positioned of all of these employees to bend the nature of these institutions away from cultural destruction towards a qualified cultural resource. Now, while instilling a sense of racial pride in Indian students could be commensurate with federal priorities, it's also the case that working to ensure young students did not feel ashamed for being Indian or separated from an indigenous community is also an effort by a cohort of Native women to protect the integrity of a generation of Native children's sense of self and community. During the decades from 1880 to 1930, this was no small achievement, right, during the height of the assimilation era. Yet because this sense of pan-Indianism does not square well with the sort of intertribal platform that would drive the American Indian movement of the later 20th century. Most histories don't include these women as a part of a larger indigenous political movement, let alone consider them as activists. And this is why I think Kellogg's statement about the noble souls working as teachers in the Indian boarding schools was meant to include native people mostly women who worked in the system, including herself, right? She saw them as activists working to deliver quality schooling to Native children. And so in Kellogg's appraisal, I think there's an important lesson, right? Native activism in education, it didn't disappear between the mostly male treaty signers who negotiated resources for schooling in the late 19th century and the mainly male, excuse me, the many male post-war activists who went on to found AIM and to create survival schools, right? So Native activism continued during assimilation, but was often carried forward by Native women who attempted to build careers with which they could look after the well-being of Native children through their labor inside of federal schools. So consequently, rather than being only cogs in a colonial machine, I argue that indigenous teachers of this era were actually holding up a crucial bridge, right, to a next generation of indigenous activism in the post-war period. Now, while there's much that remains to be researched about this cohort, I think Laura Cornelius Kellogg was on to something, an invitation for us to consider 
but the noble service of some few earnest souls in Indian schooling could and did include indigenous educators themselves, a cohort of women who were perhaps more dexterous in wielding lesson plans and blackboards to defray the totalizing pressure of the boarding school on Native students than we might imagine. And so within their careers and stories lie experiences which complicate the nature of boarding schools and our understanding of how and who they changed over time. So thank you all. I'm looking forward to hearing from our other panelists um, who I think we could just sort of up and declare we're all, also very interested in sort of Native women activists in particular. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Matt. That was really informative. Um, and uh, we will, uh, there's a, there is a good question for you. We'll, we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. Um, so right now, we're going to just take a 30-second pause and transition uh, to uh, Dr. Jen Rose Smith, who I introduced to you earlier. Um, and, and I did see her for a second. Um, hey, I'm here. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So, uh, Jen, we've given your introduction, and I, I gave a brief abstract of um, uh, Petrovich. So um, you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I just want to start by saying um, hello and thanks to the organizers of the Diversity Forum. I don't know if they can hear me out there in the ether, but thanks to them and thank you, Susan, for moderating and facilitating our talk and prepping us. I appreciate that labor that you did. You. Um, so today I'll be talking just briefly about 1940s Alaska uh, Native organizing. Um, so I'll focus on Elizabeth Paratrovich, whose Tlingit name was Kakogat and she was from the Lukadadi clan um, of the Raven Moiety. So I, before I begin, I just also want to preface that um, I'm not an historian, um, nor am I a specialist of this time period, but I am a fangirl of Elizabeth Paratrovich. So many Alaska Native folks are, so that's not unusual, but um, being a fangirl can maybe, you know, float the, the rest of this talk here. So. If you would like to enjoy some content from proper Alaska Native historians uh, who discuss Elizabeth Paratrovich and her legacy, I recommend the work of my colleagues, Dr. Holly Geis, who's a Nupiak, um, and she studies World War II Alaska, and she also has this chapter in an edited collection titled Elizabeth Paratrovich, the Alaska Native Sisterhood and Indigenous Women's Activism from 1943 to 1947. Um, and I actually read her piece to learn more about Elizabeth Paratrovich to, to um, share this with you all. Um, another person I want to mention is my colleague, Dr. Kasky Russell, who is also Tlinget, and he is actually a relative of Elizabeth Paratrovich, and he's got some great um, videos on YouTube of his talks where he's looking into the history that his family um, had told him about um, Elizabeth Paratrovich in that um, at one point she had met Martin Luther King, and then he did some more research on his own and found that um, they not only met each other, but they had actually taken a summer course together at Fisk University in 1965 that was called Race Relations. So an interesting bit of history that he talks more about. Um, okay, so the moments that I'll be discussing happened in 1940s Alaska. And to think about that time period, we do need to do a little bit of contextualizing to kind of get us oriented to that moment. So in my estimation, that involves thinking about when Alaska was sold as a territory to the United States. Um, and that happened in 1867. So it was purchased from Russia. Um, so 1867 and prior, Russia was mostly occupying ports for trade around the southern coasts of Alaska. So they had traveled some into the rivers, into the interior, but essentially most everything that we know and understand to be like the interior and northern Alaska was essentially unknown to, to, to Russian folks and um, Pramishleneki, they're called sort of um, imperial agents of the Russian crown. So when the, the U.S. and Russia began talking of the purchase of the landmass, 
they drafted the Treaty of Session. And in that treaty, um, the purchase of Alaska, no Alaska Native nations were consulted or negotiated with. So the land was basically acquired wholesale in an imperial fashion without any treaties or any negotiation with Alaska Native peoples or distinct Alaska Native tribes. So today there are 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, which constitutes almost half of all 574 federally recognized tribes. So if you think about it in that respect, um, the diversity and range of Alaska Native tribes and specific nations in Alaska is quite vast. So to not have any negotiation or any individual treaty making um, is pretty fraudulent. Um, So in that context, in thinking about no negotiation being done with Alaska Native peoples, a lot of Alaska Native activists and thinkers and intellectuals say that Alaska actually isn't U.S. land then because the land was never ceded, the land was never transferred or purchased from Alaska Native tribes. Um, And I'll say that that history of having no trees and no negotiation um, with specific distinct tribes really does go on to shape Alaska Native politics through history and into the contemporary moment. Okay, so we have 1867, the purchase of Alaska by the US, and then Alaska doesn't become a proper state, doesn't have statehood until 1959. And the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which was the sort of single unifying um, land claim settlement for all Alaska Native peoples, that doesn't happen until 1971. So basically we have this 100 plus year time period um, of you know, several waves of gold rushes, um, extraction of other resources like through mines and through the commercial fishing industry. Um, and all throughout that time, Alaska Natives on the whole are being put through this very strange process of racialization that basically precludes their access to Indigenous rights, and that includes Indigenous uh, rights to land. So Alaska Native folks were understood as non-Indigenous, actually, as racialized subjects until about 1933, wherein they were bundled in with federal Indian policy with um, American Indian nations. So in addition to being racialized as non-Indigenous and therefore not having access to legal structures in order to make claims to land, Alaska Native peoples also uh, faced rampant and extreme racism and segregation in their everyday lives. So in particular, one kind of undertold history in Alaska then is um, the practicing of Jim Crow policies or Jim Crow law in what was then the territory in Alaska at the time. So in that time period, uh, we saw explicit segregation of social spaces, so cordoning off parts for whites only. Many businesses would not allow entry to Native people at all. And this was um, signaled often by signs and windows that would say, no Natives allowed or no Natives, no dogs. Um, So schools were segregated as well. And this also meant, of course, that access to employment was segregated in this way too. So to combat some of this racism, the Alaska Native Brotherhood, or ANB, and Alaska Native Sisterhood, or ANS, they were both created in 1912 to serve as organizations to lobby for Native rights and for the equal treatment of Alaska Native peoples. ANB and ANS, basically, they focus major of... uh, The majority of their energy is on promoting Native solidarity across the state. They sought to achieve U.S. citizenship. Um, They wanted to abolish racial prejudice and wanted to secure economic equality, largely through the recognition of Indian land title and mineral rights. And A&B and ANS were patterned off of this uh, non-Native fraternal organization known as the Arctic Brotherhood, which was a formal fishing union that strenuously lobbied the US government for Alaskan congressional representation. So what became ANB and ANS, they saw this non-Native organization lobbying Congress for rights in, in the territory and Native folks said, well, we can do that too. We can definitely do that. So those two organizations lobbied federal officials to grant Alaska Natives full citizenship status. And in 1924, the US government acquiesced and passed the Indian Citizenship Act. 
So in addition to all of that important organizing that was done by A&B and ANS, I also want to highlight the work especially of Elizabeth Paratrovich, who worked with and for both organizations to lobby for the Anti-Discrimination Act, which is also called the 1945 Alaska Equal Rights Act. So Elizabeth Paratrovich was the leader of ANS at this time, and her husband, Roy Paratrovich, was the leader of ANB at the time, so definitely um, a power couple. And what they did was they utilized the, the war to their benefit to gain traction around their cause to bring equal rights to the territory of Alaska. So to do so, and again, as my colleague Holly Geis writes, the pair wrote flurries of letters to the governor of the time and um, letters to other relevant politicians. And what they did in those letters is they highlighted the patriotism of Alaska Native men who had served and fought as soldiers in the war, but then, you know, at, in returning to their homelands of Alaska were essentially treated as less than equal. So in addition to the letter writing and the other forms of organizing by ANB and ANS, there were also these other pockets of Alaska Native demonstration that happened um, specifically in Nome, which were sit-ins in movie theaters. So Native folks would go to the movie theater and sit in the whites only section and refuse to move. And that was happening throughout the 1940s. So in lobbying for the Anti-Discrimination Act, the first vote for the act came in 1943 and it did not pass actually the first time that it went up. Um, Elizabeth Paratrovich and her team did not quit. They continued to organize. Um, they worked to organize the Native communities so that their voices would be heard, and they did that by staging conventions across the state. And I may be wrong here, but I do believe that was the first time that that happened in the state of Alaska. And that happened also, these conventions were happening um, at the same time where Alaska Natives were compromising almost three-sevenths of the whole state population, so quite a considerable number. And one of the most famous speeches of uh, Elizabeth Paratrovich was given in 1945, and this was during the most intense parts of lobbying for the passing of the Equal Rights Act. Um, so her speech was given in response to a man named Alan Shattuck, and Shattuck was a senator at the time, and he saw all of this organizing and convention building that A and B and ANS were doing, and he said in response to that, quote, the races should be kept further apart. Who are these people, barely out of savagery, who want to associate with us whites with 5,000 years of recorded civilization behind us, end quote. So Paratrovich, and this is one of the things that she's most famous for, um, in Alaska you can find this quote uh, so in murals and just sort of all over um, places in the state. So per Paratrovich's response to Shattuck was, quote, I would not have expected that I, who am barely out of savagery, would have to remind gentlemen with 5,000 years of recorded civilization behind them of our Bill of Rights, end quote. So following her speech, the bill was passed that day on February 8th in 1945, and she is said um, as helping to begin a new era in Alaskan race relations. And in 1998 in Alaska, February 16th actually became known as Elizabeth Paratrovich Day, and she really does continue to be celebrated as this Alaska Native civil rights leader and icon who brought civil rights change to the territory of Alaska about two decades prior to the civil rights movement and organizing in the continental United States. And just as a plug here before I, I end, I just want to say if you're interested in learning more about this history and also watching some like kid friendly content about Alaska Native politics, um, Molly of Denali is a really good source for that. And the last episode of this show actually um, talks about Elizabeth Paratrovich and um, racism. And again, it's packaged in, in a, a kid friendly sort of kid accessible manner. So just wanted to plug that one piece of media before I end. So I'll pass it back to you, Susan. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jen, very much. Um, as before we transition into Sasha, who's going to also be talking about activist women 
um, fighting for civil rights. Um, there is a, and 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 we seem to have an education theme going on, starting with Matt here. Um, there's a wonderful documentary called "Ending Jim Crow in Alaska" that features. Uh, uh, Petrovich. So um, I am now, uh, Sasha, if you're ready, I'm going to move us over to uh, your title slide. Whoops, I'm sorry. Let's go back a couple. There we are. There you are. Okay, Sasha, we are um, anxious to hear what you have to say about the Minneapolis Indian Center. Well, uh, <clears throat> bonjour, Anin. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to echo the thanks of um, Matt and Jen, um, to everyone who has already been thanked uh, for being a part of organizing and moderating uh, this diversity forum panel. A quick note on terminology before I kind of dive in here. In this paper, I use uh, the terms American Indian, Indian, and Indigenous. American Indian is a legal specific term. I use the term Indian, though it is no longer preferred by many indigenous peoples of what is now North America, uh, precisely because it was the language used by the people that I write about. Um, and indigenous is kind of the current preference for a lot of people. All right. On May 4th, 1975, the urban American Indian community from South Minneapolis gathered outside of a large building on Franklin Avenue. The building was a sight to behold. Its large front facade was made of cement with extensive intricate wood paneling designed by Ojibwe artist George Morrison. Large glass windows sink into the ground where small amphitheater-like areas enter onto the bottom level of the Indian Center, which houses a gymnasium, a gathering space, and an Indian arts business. Additional rooms on the second and third floor contain classrooms, a library, a meeting space. The building was at the time known as the Minneapolis Regional Native American Center, but as would become common among community and made official not long after its opening, this building was and has been called the Minneapolis American Indian Center for nearly five decades. Those gathered were celebrating the momentous occasion of its its official opening, a dream fulfilled that the urban American Indian community had fought for for decades. While the Indian Center, as it's known colloquially, has long been a fixture, its origins have been complicated by differing narratives and memories that shift around what counts as activism, and specifically indigenous activism in the mid 20th century. In my work, I argue that the actual foundations of the Indian Center were created by indigenous women who had planned, developed, and integrated urban indigenous agendas into the wider Minneapolis community as a means of securing an urban indigenous future that allows for us to not only retain tribal identities, but to empower the continuation of indigenous epistemologies. Though there was a strong tight knit urban indigenous community in Minneapolis in the years before World War II, the post-war years saw a tremendous influx of indigenous migrants to the city from nearby reservations. Movement to cities were encouraged by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or BIA, through their voluntary relocation program, which officially began in 1953. Through a relocation, the federal government hoped to shift indigenous populations to a select number of cities, which had been approved for their industry and perceived willingness to accept indigenous peoples. This policy worked in tandem with the government's legislative policy of termination, which was designed to strip tribal nations of their federal recognition and thus allow the US to, quote, get out of the Indian business uh, by severing federal services such as education and health care. So these twin policies of relocation and termination combined represented another phase of US's uh, assimilation agenda, agenda. Federal Indian Affairs had, for decades, if not longer, sought out the delimitation of indigenous sovereignty through indigenous assimilation into what was perceived as the American melting pot. So through termination, the US was able to sever legal and economic responsibilities to tribal nations and to abrogate treaty rights and dismantle reservations of targeted tribes. Relocation then would move indigenous peoples off of reservations or former reservations and into cities where they were encouraged to use city services for any assistance with welfare, healthcare, education, employment, and so on. Minneapolis was not an official relocation city itself. 
Indeed, in the 1950s, the BIA regional director was determined to provide as few resources as possible to newly arrived indigenous peoples in the city. I should note here that discrimination was not new to urban indigenous peoples. Those who had lived in the cities uh, before 1950s had their share of stories of what one Ojibwe woman termed, quote, a city full of prejudice. Yet the post-war years exposed the root of indigenous struggles to access good housing, stable employment, and any other multitude of social services as a result of a clear and purposefully convoluted positioning of what is commonly termed the Indian problem. The problem, in short, was that Indians, who were tribal citizens of tribal nations that had signed legally binding treaties with the United States, were an apparent drain on the U.S., upholding its federal obligations to tribal nations, and thus their peoples cost too much money, and their lands, which were so drastically reduced even from original reservation borders, could conceivably be better used by non-Indigenous peoples. When promoting urban migration to Indigenous peoples, the federal government, typically responsible for delivering social services to American Indians, did little to prepare any sort of system that could adequately support the transportation of those needs into city spaces. The federal government held that they were now the city's responsibility, and the city held that they were the federal government's. This lack of clarity of who would provide services for urban indigenous peoples in Minneapolis only became more frustrating for community members as their community expanded, and it did rapidly. At the end of World War II, there were an estimated two to 3,000 American Indians living in the city. By 1961, this number had grown to six to 8,000, and by 1969, the community exceeded 10,000. It's important to note that these estimates are actually likely quite low, as enumeration of indigenous peoples, particularly in cities, should always be viewed as a conservative estimate. Even at the time, indigenous community members were saying that these estimates were far too low. It should go perhaps without saying then, that as the population grew, the disparities facing indigenous peoples widened. American Indians in Minneapolis were quite vocal, at least with one another, about the oppressive conditions that they were facing. Housing was among the top and most pressing concerns for urban natives. They often struggled to find housing in South Minneapolis. They were often able to secure leases in only subpar deteriorating houses in the densely populated Phillips neighborhood. The reason was clear to indigenous peoples. Landlords were actively discriminating against them. It wasn't unheard of for indigenous peoples to schedule an appointment to see an apartment or a house with a potential landlord, only for them to show up and be turned away because the landlord didn't realize they were Indian or to be steered to a house that was falling apart. Equally pressing was the need for assistance securing good and stable employment. Despite the promises often presented to American Indian peoples that the city was where to go for work, many struggled to find jobs, and if they did, they often found it hard to keep them. Many Minneapolis Indian leaders have detailed how they were turned away or were fired first when it was time to let anyone go. Multiple city reports acknowledge that bosses were hesitant to hire Indians because they thought they were flighty or unreliable or prone to drunkenness. Also evident was the abysmal failure on the part of the city's welfare systems, which few Indian families qualified for when they needed it most given residency requirements. Finally, if you add on the tendency for service agencies to shuttle indigenous peoples from agency to agency or to forego that altogether and tell them to go back to the reservation, it was clear to indigenous people that their presence in the city was really only supported by the community itself. Still, the indigenous community didn't sit passively by accepting this situation. Indigenous women in particular had been fundraising for indigenous youth and families in need for decades. They had also created substantial awareness among non-indigenous Minneapolitans through their efforts, which allowed them to amass support for indigenous peoples on their own terms. This is particularly clear in the ways they utilized churches and community centers to gain access to physical space and support in the 1950s. In addition to integrating themselves into these kinds of citywide institutions, Indigenous women were also a strong force behind the creation of an American Indian Center. In the late 50s, Indigenous women and men joined together to begin planning what would become the Upper Midwest American Indian Center, which would officially be incorporated in 1961. Upper Midwest's founding members and many of its early board and staff were Ojibwe and Dakota women. Its founding charter articulated their goals to serve and support the urban indigenous community as, quote, an educational, civic, and cultural organization, end quote, while promoting intertribal fellowship and, quote, a bond of understanding among Indians and non-Indians, 
end quote. Since its founding, Indigenous women have made up a majority of its staff and its directorship, including a decade-long stint by former secretary turned director and Ojibwe woman Emily Peak. She, in turn, was replaced by another Ojibwe woman, Gertrude Bakanaga, who ran the center for decades. Upper Midwest was the first in a series of battles to create a fully funded American Indian Center, and it remains a place out of which urban indigenous community in Minneapolis can find support, particularly in relation to indigenous youth. While Upper Midwest was a tremendous accomplishment, those running the center experienced continual struggles to make the center work for the community. They suffered from a lack of stable funding, which meant the vast majority of their staff went unpaid for its first few years. The lack of capital also meant that they struggled to maintain a permanent residence and were forced to move no fewer than four times by 1968. Connected to all of these issues, those at Upper Midwest were constantly emphasizing that they simply did not have enough space or money to properly serve the community as it rapidly expanded. This was particularly clear in relation to services. Since everyone at Upper Midwest knew they lacked capital, they were forced to tell community members they were unable to provide employment or housing assistance and had to send these uh, individuals inquiring to other community centers that would then send them to city agencies and then we cycle back into that loop I was talking about earlier. As the 1960s closed, Upper Midwest had been joined by a dozen or so smaller Indian centers, and each of these centers shared similar mission statements to Upper Midwest. Regardless, each center had the same issue as well. They simply weren't large enough or supported adequately enough to provide all of the community's wants and needs in one space. The city of Minneapolis itself was aware of this issue. Indigenous women who had been regularly attending city council meetings and serving on urban in Indian issues committees regularly raised this issue of the community's desire for a single centrally located large Indian center that would be able to act as the hub of activity for services, recreation, education, and ceremony. Finally, in 1969, Hennepin County Council issued a report stating that Upper Midwest would be in charge of initiating plans for what is known today as the Minneapolis American Indian Center. Those at Upper Midwest began a tedious process of grant writing for federal model city and anti-poverty programs, uh, attending city council meetings and Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board meetings, all to secure funding and land for the center. Now, I don't have time to go into the detail about the messiness of this center itself. It's really a story unto itself. Uh, but the end results are the same, and they take us back to where I started this presentation. In 1975, as the Indian Center officially opened its doors, Indigenous women were there. These Indigenous women who worked to found the Indian Center regularly argued they weren't leaders. Some would probably never have called themselves activists, but as one beloved and well-known elder by the name of Winnie Jourdain said, we fought, we were there. And they were there, though their work behind the scenes has been obscured in favor of flashier narratives of activism, which the city of Minneapolis was also not lacking in at the time. Still, I argue their work should necessarily be construed as activism, precisely because they subverted the very systems designed to assimilate them as tribal peoples. By refusing to have their indigeneity ignored in civic institutions, indigenous women were taking an active stance, not just against federal policies, but also against the violence they encountered within urban systems that routinely discriminated against the community. Further, by working tirelessly to provide the community with programs, services, and physical space, indigenous women were supporting the community's desires to proudly retain their indigeneity in a way that forced the city to reckon with indigenous peoples. Their work, both in founding the Minneapolis American Indian Center and in so many other ways, fundamentally changed indigenous experience in the city. In fact, they fundamentally reshaped parts of the cities to represent urban indigenous peoples. Their legacies are literally written onto the landscape of today's Minneapolis indigenous community. That kind of work, that kind of change has allowed all of us to envision stronger, more vibrant indigenous futures. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. That was really um, informative. Um, I can't wait till you write the book on Winnie Jourdain and we get to hear more about her. Um, as our panel does seem to be uh, focusing on women activists, either in, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, right? Rather, right there. 
So thank you so much for that um, insightful look. We're going to stay now um, in the mini in the Minnesota, in our sister state, and as we move to Dr. Casey Keeler um, for her presentation about tribal housing, activism, land, and property. Casey, are you ready? Yes. Okay, wonderful. You can go ahead whenever you're ready. All right, good afternoon. So I will be building on the momentum of my colleagues who each innovatively considers the many ways Native people and Native communities have engaged with activism. But instead of focusing on Native women, I want to turn our attention to think about the ways American Indian housing has become a site of often unrecognized and certainly less visible activism. The United States is built on the dispossession of native land. Native land has been transformed, exchanged, contained, degraded, bought, and sold during the 400 years of colonialism across North America. Against the backdrop of this stark history, American Indians have long been seen as anti-modern communal land holders without an understanding of private property. Despite this, Native community members and tribal nations have played an active and increasingly visible role in contemporary land transactions. No longer relegated to reservations, American Indians have entered the free market exchange of land off reservation. In my talk today, I want to, I work to emphasize the many ways Native people use land as capital to resist settler colonialism to expand their land base and to house their tribal members. To begin, I offer a very brief overview of American Indian land dispossession in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Then I offer two really great examples of the ways American Indian people fought to access improved housing during the mid 20th century. Next, I'll spend the second half of my talk um, and brief time today discussing current examples of the distinct, innovative, and exciting work tribal nations are doing to expand their land base, to provide housing for tribal citizens, and to challenge and resist settler colonialism. Minnesota and Wisconsin, much like the entirety of the United States, are native homelands. Historically and traditionally, the Dakota and Ojibwe have called present-day Minnesota home while present-day Wisconsin has been the homelands of the Menominee, Ojibwe, Dakota, Potawatomi, and Ho-Chunk. Throughout the 19th century, driven by waves of non-native settlement, treaties were made between the federal government and tribal nations. In less than a century, the native people who had long been home in their homelands across present-day Minnesota and Wisconsin, the present or I'm sorry, the population of American Indians reached its lowest point in history while they were simultaneously isolated to smaller and smaller parcels of land, land that we recognize today as reservations. Since the mid-1930s, this land has been held in trust by the federal government, making home ownership and access to funding for tribal housing incredibly complex but not to be left behind in the mass construction of single family homes that has marked the mid 20th century, particularly after World War II, are American Indian people who have fought to reclaim their cultures, their communities, and their land. In 1953, in the midst of the American Indian Relocation Program that worked to move thousands of American Indians away from their reservations and to urban centers as a component of the larger termination era, Gerald Owens, an Ojibwe man from White Earth, Minnesota, worked to, to secure improved housing for his family in Minneapolis. Not satisfied with the housing opportunities available to him through the relocation program, which was administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and finding it difficult to navigate the home loan component of the GI Bill, which he was eligible for as a World War II veteran, Owens purchased his home a larger home with ample space for a garden plot in Ham Lake, a present day suburb of Minneapolis, located approximately 25, 20 miles north of the urban core. Just over a decade later, on the heels of the civil rights movement 
and amid a steadily growing urban Indian community. American Indian community members in Minneapolis and St. Paul began meeting to discuss community-wide concerns. Soon, these community gatherings became the foundation for the politically-minded American Indian movement, widely recognized as AIM. It would not be long before AIM and its leaders saw the need for native-oriented housing development to help American Indians transition from the reservation to the city without losing touch with their traditional values. AIM worked with government agencies and social service organizations to make this native-run housing community a reality. Thus, the origins of the first and only native preference public housing complex, which is still in operation today, located in South Minneapolis, took shape. These two examples, one from the 1950s and one from the late 1960s and early 1970s, reveal the ways Native people were taking charge of their own housing opportunities, opportunities that had long been limited by both policy and racism. It was also during the same time period that numerous studies and government reports regularly highlighted the great need for improved Indian housing, both on reservations and in urban centers. By 1975, Federal Indian policy shifted away from termination and relocation to that of the American Indian self-determination. A policy era that has witnessed the return of increasing amounts of tribal autonomy and authority, particularly in the administration and use of federal funds. Today, a time of continued American Indian self-determination, an increasing number of tribal nations are seeking innovative ways to access land, capital, and housing to improve the lives of their tribal citizens. Three examples of this exciting work include the Mille Lacs and Red Lake bands of Ojibwe in Minnesota and the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin. In March 2013, the Mille Lacs band of Ojibwe announced their purchase of two hotels in downtown St. Paul. The purchase of the, purchase of the I'm sorry, the purchase of the Crown Plaza Riverfront and the Double Tree by Hilton was part of a long-term strategy to diversify the band's investments beyond gambling. In the years since, the Mille Lacs band has purchased and redeveloped additional hotel properties in Oklahoma City in St. Louis Park, which lies immediately west of Minneapolis, as well as Eddie's Resort, a fishing resort located in central Minnesota. Today, the Mille Lacs band of Ojibwe, whose reservation lies in central Minnesota and hugs the southern shore of Lake Mille Lacs, continues to expand on their strategic plan with a focus on the hospitality industry. Importantly, the tribe remains a response, maintains a responsibility to the next seven generations as part of Ojibwe cultural and traditional teachings, as it makes decisions about investments, culture, sustainability, and economic development. As revenue is generated by these investments outside of their reservation community, the tribe is better positioned to provide a variety of services to tribal members, including housing. Today, the tribe's housing, de housing department strives to provide affordable, attractive, safe and comfortable homes with money generated from these external economic developments. This is done through both home ownership and rental programs. In 2016, the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe whose reservation is located in Northern Minnesota, followed the lead of Mille Lacs in buying off reservation property in the heart of the Twin Cities. However, in stark contrast to Mille Lacs, the parcel of land Red Lake purchased had long been sitting vacant and had previously been used for industry, requiring money for cleanup and redevelopment. In 2018, two years after Red Lake purchased the land, a dire need for American Indian housing arose. And what became a very visible display of American Indian homelessness or houselessness, the wall of forgotten natives was formed against the backdrop of a major highway that bisects the city of Minneapolis. Called the wall of forgotten natives because of its geographical location alongside a highway and only blocks away from the Little Earth housing complex, the nearly 200 tents that made up the Wall of Forgotten Natives called attention to the long history of American Indian dispossession, lack of federal supports and services, racism, and ongoing housing needs across Indian country 
and in urban areas. Ahead of winter's arrival in the fall of 2018, the Red Lake Nation offered up its parcel of land for use as a temporary housing facility to provide safe and warm refuge for those whose only shelter had been the thin walls of aging and weathered tents. Since the winter of 2018-2019, the Red Lake Nation has redeveloped this parcel of land into Minno Bimadazawin, a 110-unit income-restricted housing facility, the name of which roughly translates to the good life in English. One of the first tribally sponsored housing developments in the U.S. today, Minno Bimadazawin is home to the Red Lake Nation Embassy of Minneapolis, a wellness clinic, and remote classes offered by the Red Lake Nation College. In Wisconsin, Metaconicum, a community-based gas, grassroots organization based out of the Menominee Nation has taken a different approach to housing tribal members. As a nonprofit organization, Metaconicum owns a small parcel of land, about 80 acres, just outside the Menominee Reservation in central Wisconsin. Minneconicum, whose mission is built around community wellness and cultural revitalization, has recognized the need for transitional housing for community members in need. To begin to address this need, Minneconicum has raised funds and community support to build tiny homes on the land they own adjacent to their reservation. These tiny homes for healing provide an opportunity for community members to find safe spaces during times of transition that connect them to the land, language, and identity. Much like Red Lake housing, much like Red Lake's housing complex in Minneapolis, Minneconicum recognizes the important role of culture and the need for wraparound services, in addition to providing safe shelter for community members. Taken together, these three contemporary examples of tribal communities doing good work to support tribal members through land, economic development, and the construction of housing is part of longer efforts of Native people to coexist within settler colonialism. The work of the Mille Lacs and Red Lake Bands of Ojibwe in Minnesota and Minneconicum in Wisconsin are only three examples of tribal nations taking the lead to house and provide for tribal members. The need for housing across Indian country and outside of Indian country is great and follows from long histories of dispossession that violently separated Native peoples from their homelands throughout the 19th century. Today, Native communities and tribal nations across the U.S. are reconciling land loss and land-based housing needs through land buybacks and off-reservation economic development. The work of these Native peoples, communities, and tribal organizations force us to reconsider what activism looks like. In many ways, these examples shared with you today are on the cutting edge of community need response, building from the ground up, simultaneously engaging with capitalism as a means of resisting settler colonialism and reclaiming indigenous space. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Casey. It was just a perfect way to end our panel, I think, by bringing in these um, very contemporary examples of um, indigenous activism. Um, it was wonderful. Um, uh, while we are collecting some questions, I am just going to try to pull together a couple of threads for us. I found it very interesting um, that the Society of American Indians, uh, founded in Columbus, Ohio, as well as the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood, all formed at the same time, and whose major platform was enfranchisement of Native peoples. Um, which, for those of you who are not aware, um, American Indians and Alaska Natives were the last uh, group uh, in the United States to be enfranchised um, in 1924. Also, it's also wonderful to note that we are, have really moved on from uh, what some scholars call damage-based scholarship and the victimization that was often um, talked about in the 1980s. And so this is really all cutting edge, whether it's historical or contemporary examples of Native peoples asserting uh, their own sovereignty and self-determination. <clears throat> and so um, we have a couple of questions that have come in. 
Um, starting with the very, uh, at the beginning of our panel, um, there was a question uh, for Matt um, from Sarah Hallis, um, asking if you are connecting Laura Kellogg's work to that of John Dewey. So if you could uh, just briefly uh, entertain that question, there are some more that are coming in as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's my pleasure. I mean, Jen kicked us off with this great academic jargon of fangirling. Um, and so the story of my dissertation is one of fanboying over American pragmatism as a philosophical movement, particularly associated with John Dewey. Um, and so as I started doing this work, I'm sort of trying to figure what is America's quintessential philosophical movement? What is its relationship to America's quintessential historical development of settler colonialism? What is the relationship between those two things? Um, the dissertation sort of evolved by saying, you know what, uh, Dewey is sort of an interesting guy who's connecting these big ideas of democracy and education together, what I call in my work the synthesis of education and democracy, very original. Um, I was interested in that idea and how people articulate that connection at this turn of the century moment where the United States is going through arguably this transition to modernity, right, through urbanization, industrialization, immigration, and so Dewey sort of thinking about, well, schools should be the place where the melting pot of culture happens, right? And so the model for a multicultural democratic society is the settlement house. And so the more I started thinking about this, the more I started thinking, like, none of this works as a synthesis for education and democracy in Indian country. And so the second half of my dissertation sort of looks for a model that would and Kellogg's book in 1922 called Our Democracy, interesting hailing all Americans, Our Democracy and the Indian, is sort of, I argue, a, a really important kind of canonical text that sort of pushes away from this notion of, you know, the settlement house as the vision for a society like a multicultural modern, um, by saying instead uh, Native people should have reservation-based homelands where by extension they ought to control their own schools or exert control over federal schools on those reservations. So yes, broadly speaking, that's the project of my dissertation of sort of putting those two things together because I think that most people in ed circles have no idea who people like Laura Cornelius Kellogg is, and they ought to. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, maybe we got to get you into the education school here and give a couple of talks, right? Yeah. So um, our, I'm sorry about that. I accidentally hit the wrong screen. So bear with me one second um, while I try to give this back to our question slide. There we go. So there is another question that came in um, regarding uh, sources. This is from Ian Canovi, or Canovi, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, regarding sources for activism uh, in the city of Milwaukee, um, which kind of mirrored Minneapolis in a slight in a slightly different way. Uh, there was the takeover of the Coast Guard station, which turned into the first survival school, which is now turned into a big, very, very productive and, and slightly famous um, Indian school in uh, Franklin, Wisconsin. And I would direct you to um, look at the work of Meg Newden, N-O-O-D-I-N. Meg Newden is a professor of Ojibwe and American Indian Studies at UWM, and she is currently working on a large project um, about Milwaukee activism. So I would direct you to her work, and maybe one of our panelists um, who has expertise in Minnesota might know something a little bit more about the Milwaukee area. Uh, Sasha, have you come across anything in, in your work? Do you know anyone that's currently working in the in this besides Meg? Um, I do not. I know that Susan Applegate Krauss has published, I think, a couple right. articles specifically on the Indian Community School as well. Um, there, 
are, of course, those links, particularly because of the American Indian Movement, which was founded in Minneapolis in 1968. But of course, there was a chapter in, in Milwaukee as well. Um, just in terms of resources at UW or UWM, um, if you're looking for primary source materials as well, it could be helpful to look for American Indian newsletters. I know here at UW, the, the Wisconsin Historical Society has a large, large, large collection of newsletters. And I know for a fact that there are a number of um, American Indian newsletters, some perhaps a little more locally in terms of other parts of Wisconsin. Um, but I have not had an opportunity to really kind of see what other resources are available um, in relation to Milwaukee activism. So I'm, I'm just going to tag on with, uh, with what you said uh, regarding archives and resources. Uh, Marquette University Archives uh, in the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions has a treasure trove of the newsletters that were published all around the Indian activism of the 60s and 70s. Um, and the Susan Applegate Krauss, um, the late Susan Applegate Krauss, uh, her article is called What Became of What Came After the Takeovers. And I believe that Meg is going to include it in a, in a book that she's working on. So um, we have another question coming in um, uh, that indicates that uh, from Jules Arensdorf, who said that Wonk Sheik, which is our UW Madison student organization, is doing a lot of work documenting indigenous activism on this campus, um, which we know is decades and decades old, right? It's um, been around since the 1960s that I'm aware of. Maybe it goes back even further than that. Um, so thank you, Jules, for that comment, um, if someone is interested in the activism here on campus. And now that we have um, two new historians joining us, both Sasha and Matt, um, we know that, that something's going to come soon, right, of, of uh, publications or more information about specific activism in Wisconsin as well as at UW. Uh, Sarah Hellis is thanking Matt for your um, information. She says, I definitely agree educators should be aware of Laura Cornelius Kellogg's work as we are of John Dewey's. And so this is another way that our activist scholars are now placing side by side our um, indigenous intellectuals. Um, beginning from the early, even from the progressive movement on, are placing them side by side in the history books. And this is important. And not just in the history books, but starting in the classrooms, um, as I indicated in the introduction, the very act that we are in the classrooms um, makes us activists, academic activists, um, working towards um, improving and recognizing indigenous sovereignty and self-determination and well-being, as Sasha would say. Casey, do you have anything that you might want to add? Because you have a good sense of uh, going last, you have a good sense of scope. Um, I was actually just typing a message into chat in okay. that there is a new book, like a very new book that just came out on Laura Cornelius Kellogg, um, edited by um, Christina Ackley, who is Oneida. Um, I guess it's not super new anymore. I don't know why I was thinking it was like brand new. I think I just saw it getting re-promoted um, online. Um, but okay, also so in terms of- Totally right, that's the book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, also, in terms of activism in Wisconsin, particularly around mini, or I'm sorry, Milwaukee, I think a lot of it gets kind of like buried under or tied to the Indian Community School. So if somebody's looking at those records, um, I think it's definitely worth looking at the Indian Community School records as well. Mm -hmm. um, the University of Wisconsin, I think system wide, also has a subscription to the Indian newspapers. Um, so that's like a really great archival collection to kind of dig through if you're looking for something in particular. Um, there's also really great archival records at the Newberry Library in Chicago. So 
Um, to be fair, Sasha and myself are both from the Twin Cities. So that's kind of why we both focus on the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. But I know up until we were doing our work, um, most of the attention on American Indian activism was occurring in places like Chicago and Los Angeles in the Bay Area. Um, so it's kind of this new kind of momentum of scholarship that's turning um, a necessary eye on the Twin Cities in Minneapolis in particular. I think that we are pushing on time. There's one more question in the chat dealing with the Atlanta Braves and the Tomahawk Chalk. And I would just want to say that when the Atlanta Braves were the Milwaukee Braves, there was a mascot that used to run around the field called Chief Nakahomer. And um, before that, they were the Boston Braves. And so this is going to have to be a conversation for another time. But you have got our information, and you are welcome to send an email. And we can. I am more than willing to start another conversation about mascots. But right now, um, our session is up. And I want to thank all of our panelists for doing such a wonderful job today. Um, and thank Dana Goodman for moderating the chat for us and for Joe, our tech person, and to all of you who have um, given us your time and your consideration today in listening to our panel. Thank you so much.